This program is made possible in part by a grant from the Rouse Company Foundation. The Howard County Poetry and Literature Society presents The Writing Life. Writer and musician Terry Winch talks with novelist and short story writer John McGarren. Hi, my name is Terry Winch. Welcome to The Writing Life. It's my uh, real pleasure today to be talking with John McGahern, one of Ireland's most distinguished novelists and short story writers. Uh, he's published five novels, the most recent of which is Amongst Women, and several collections of short stories that have just been released and published in this country uh, as the collected stories by Knopf. John, welcome to Hoko Polizzo's show. Um, one of the things I, I, that occurred to me in reading your work is that although it's, uh, critics often characterize your fiction as very dark and bleak uh, and depicting a very kind of repressed world, I found that there was an awful lot of humor, although sometimes black humor, in your work. Well, I'd like to think there is, too. Uh, and of course, there's a, I think there's a lot of confusion uh, about optimistic and pessimistic. Uh, it's thought that optimistic is good, uh, pessimistic is bad. Well, I actually think that um, both optimism and pessimism are equally irrelevant to the writer, that his job is to get at the facts of the truth. And um, uh, how those are perceived, I think, depends on the reader's mood. The writer can only bow. In fact, my favorite uh, optimist is an American that jumped off the Empire State Building. <laughs> And uh, the wind cleaners heard him as he passed the 22nd floor say, saying, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite man. <laughs> right. Do you intentionally uh, write with humor in mind? No. Uh, I mean, one writes by instinct. Um, uh, in my case, I often have, um, it's an image or a color uh, that's in my head for seven or eight years. and. Uh, um, I mean, I eventually have to write it down to see what's there. And when I do write it down, uh, often it goes away that there's nothing there. And other times it grows into work. But always uh, what one thought was there in the beginning changes if it becomes work. Mm -hmm. And one is just uh, uh, trying to get the words right. Uh, mm. And in order to get the words right, you have to actually um, feel deeply and think clearly in order to find the right words for the world that you're trying to bring us bring together. Of course, you'd go crazy if you thought you had to write a whole novel. You write it uh, a bit by day, bit and day by day, you know, as you get through life. For instance, when I was writing Amongst Women, um, there was a scene for years in my head of a London road um, and uh, a two mar a married couple living above a park. Um, in summer, the trees used to green uh, and in winter, they'd die away, and you could see the s children's swings inside the park. And that was the beginning of Amongst Women, and there was about 200 or 300 pages of the novel, of the original novel, set in London. And then this family from Ireland came and pushed all that London material, which was the beginning of the novel, oh. out. And in fact, the London material only got two or three pages in the final version of Amongst Women. That's, you know, that reminds me of something I did want to ask you about. There, there's a sense in your fiction of a lot of things left out in order to sort of leave in the most important things. I think of, uh, um, you know, not, for instance, in, in Amongst Women, we never hear a single word about the, uh, the, um, the first wife of, of the main character, Moran or Moran. Um, Basically, it's a search for the image. Uh, and, you know, the type of fiction writer that I am is that the image uh, is central to the whole grammar of the work. Uh, and it's basically trying out of the mass of feelings and thoughts and emotions to bring uh, that image that moves us out into the light. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be a simple thing as a wedding ring that won't stay mm -hmm. off on thinning fingers that have to be searched for. And it's actually searching among all the rubble of our lives uh, in order to get that clear image that brings it together. And I think that, uh, that the image is the first thing, and that's held together by the music or the rhythm of the prose, and that the last thing is the shape, which is the most conscious part. But, but to find the image one feels and thinks 
and one works by instinct, and that's actually brought to life by the rhythm that connects the images. And it's only when the thing is finished that you put an overall intellectual shape on it. Mm -hmm. But there's um, um, no point in putting a shape on dead prose. <laughs> right, right, it's like right. sending a dead man out to a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> right. When uh, um, the, the Dark was first published in 1965, uh, it's kind of a, a well-known fact that uh, the Irish Censorship Board banned the book. That's right. And that shortly thereafter you uh, lost your job as a teacher in Dublin. And I wonder if you could um, possibly reminisce a little bit about what that felt like. Oh, it was very unpleasant because um, we, all that mattered, um, in a way, is that the, the state and church had got together. It was almost like a theocracy. I think, I mean, I have a great deal of affection and gratitude to the Catholic Church, though I no longer belong to it. But it was the dominating influence of my life, and it was the early weather of my life. And I think that you, you know, that you can't reject any of your life. Uh, I mean, that it all is part of love. Um, and the Church was the early uh, weather of that life. But by coming together with an insecure state, which it's amazing to think how young the state of Ireland is, um, is I don't think it was good for either church or state. And um, it made the church much more interested in power and less interested in spirituality. Uh, and I think that unless any religion is spiritual, it'll die even in a theocracy. And of course, um, I was, though I was implied as a state teacher, it was the church that had complete uh, control of education, and it was uh, they hired and fired the teachers, so the state paid for them and inspected that they did their work well. Um, of course, it was very grand. I got fired by the Archbishop of Dublin himself. There's not many people <laughs> can say that they got fired by an archbishop. And so, did he actually call you in? And no, he ordered the priest, uh, who was quite upset, um, um, to fire me. And it was very strange the, the day I got fired in the school. I mean, people think I wrote about it in the leave-taking, but in fact, uh, if you wrote about it, um, it's uh, that similar scene, but it isn't, isn't like it happened at all. In fact, uh, I was the most um, composed person in the school, and all the people I had thought with, and I had thought with most of them for eight or nine years, they were quite upset uh, and were making me endless cups of tea and asking me was there anything that they could do for me. <laughs> and it was like there's a Spanish film called The Executioner, when the, the, ex the person to be executed is quite happy to go to the garage <laughs> and have to drag the executioner there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they never gave any um, official the uh, union press for a reason, and all they got from the clerical authorities was Mr. McGarren is well aware uh, really? of um, uh, the reason for his dismissal. There was a very sort of a amusing story because um, Beckett and people like that in Paris were very, up well, they didn't like it. And uh, they wanted to um, uh, uh, get a protest going against it. And uh, uh, Beckett, first of all, he said he'd have to read the book first. And he read the book and liked it. And he was the only person, oddly enough, that actually insisted that you're going to have to ask uh, Mr. McGarren, does he want to protest? Mm -hmm. And I wrote back to thank uh, uh, them all in Paris uh, and to uh, I say how grateful I was to them, but I, that I didn't want to uh, uh, any protest because I thought that it would honour the damn thing too much. Mm -hmm. And when I got a, when the dark about eight years afterwards was on band, and I got this telegram, uh, radio, uh, TV, want you, uh, I actually refused to leave Paris because I thought it would be almost as disgraceful to make money mm -hmm. on the damn thing mm -hmm. in the end as to um, actually take any part uh, in the beginning. The closest that was ever got to an official um, explanation was that there was a friend of Becker called uh, Dr. Leventhal, who was the reader of French in uh, Trinity College. Mm -hmm. And there was a rather charming man called Professor O'Brien, who was a professor of French in Galway, and they knew one another well, uh, who was head of the censorship board. Hmm. And uh, Dr. Leventhal got a little bit careless when he retired to Paris, and he had in the previous week uh, got a severe ticking off uh, from the waiter at the Dome Cafe for not actually 
uh, buttoning his trousers properly and that he shouldn't be sitting out at a respectable cafe with like the door <laughs> <laughs> at a good establishment like that with the, the trousers in the shape that he was in. And when O'Brien came to Paris, Levin told him, are you all gone crazy in Ireland? What in the name of God are you doing banning McGahern's book? And O'Brien said, we can't have people running round Ireland with their flies open. <laughs> and I'm afraid Leventhal took it very personally. But that's as close as we got to a, an official explanation, which is a bit like the way the country runs itself. Is there still an Irish censorship board? No, and I think that was the last serious book oh, uh, really? to be banned. And I think it's a, it's a good job because it's a, it's a self-defeating thing. It actually brings in something. All that matters, I think, in writing is whether a thing is well written or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually believe that if a thing is well written, and I just don't mean fancy writing, that if it's written with intelligence and with feeling, it can't be immoral. Mm -hmm. That in fact, that true writing is always moral. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's also self-defeating, because actually by banning something, it's like sweets or alcohol, you actually yes. make it more attractive. Of course. Yeah. And I think everybody under 25 uh, read the dark under sheets. Uh, <laughs> I think you're uh, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it became a kind of cult book. So in fact, what you're trying to forbid, you know, ban is actually, you're actually making it more attractive. So you're right. actually undoing what you set out to do in the beginning, which isn't a very good idea, yeah. even from somebody's point of view, like a censorship point of view. Do you, uh, uh, I, I was thinking about this earlier today, how in some ways I, I think a lot of American writers would envy anyone writing something potent enough and relevant enough in their particular culture to get banned. Uh, it's almost in, in some ways a, a badge of honor. Uh, as you say, it became very popular and it, uh, it certainly, you know, established you in, 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 in a well, worldwide kind of Well, that wasn't true sense. because I actually, for the barracks, won all the state prizes. And That's I true, was actually yeah, yeah. An established, almost an established writer, which was yeah. a disgraceful p position to be in <laughs> for a young brat of 23 or right. 24. Right. But, um, you know, the dark changed all that and yeah. suddenly I was the, um, the black beast. Uh, yeah. And I lost my job and I had to work and scrounge for a living in London for four or five years. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I actually hadn't, wasn't able to write in London for three or four years. Maybe I wouldn't have written any time because yeah. there are times in my life that I haven't been able to write. Why so? I think, uh, I think that there's a, uh, I think it'd be very easy to repeat the same stuff over, over again. But I think that uh, each new work for a writer is a new beginning. Is that a writer in a way is always a beginner. I think when he ceases to be a beginner, he's almost dead. Uh, so that I think that you have to begin anew and anew. And I think areas of silence is as necessary as speech. Mm -hmm. uh, because so actually you, uh, speech and silence, I think, uh, are interdependent. Even in writing itself, yeah. uh, punctuation and paragraphs are forms of tact yeah. and consequently forms of silence. Yeah. Do you uh, uh, write uh, uh, according to any sort of routine, uh, or do you just, when you get a new, uh, when you get an idea for a book, or when you do break that silence, ha what happens? Well, I've often written for three or four months and found that it was nonsense I was writing. Yeah. And the West Paper Basket would have been my publisher. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, um, after a while, uh, you know whether it's um, going to be a short work, mainly because of its rhythm, uh, because. Um, a novel is like a large house. It has looser rhythms and, I mean, the intensity uh, that is necessary for a short story will be intolerable over the length of a novel. Uh, so that you, and of course, you know that uh, once you have a novel under your ha hands, uh, you can say goodbye for the, uh, the next four or five years. Uh, yeah. Because a novel is very unlike uh, um, a story. I mean, you can write a story because of its shape and its size. Is you can keep it all in your head. You could write it on a train or even walking in the street or not working. But for a novel, you really have to go to work every morning uh, and seven days of the week. Yeah. Uh, uh, and of course, you know what gets down on the page is only about uh, five percent uh, of actually what was the novel. Mm -hmm. And you know everything about those characters and those people. 
And in fact, by the end of a novel, it's quite sad because they actually become uh, more real than the people you're living with. And you know what they do in exactly mm -hmm. any situation. And then you have to let them go and wait a while and you start something else. And it's like moving to a new town. Could you read something for us? Well, in um, the sense of um, writing is often you get certain passages that you lean on, uh, very like uh, the tuning fork in the schoolroom, uh, that something that you find is true and that you actually uh, lean on these passages to try to raise the rest of the prose around it. Uh, one of the passages that I did lean on a lot when I was writing Amongst Women is this passage about time. And also deals with Morn, who is a, 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 in a tyrant in one sense, but his actual reality is much more complicated like that because he sometimes can be very charming. Mm -hmm. And his daughters especially love him. And like all tyrants, they're almost grateful for any uh, relief. So his charm is actually much more powerful than a person who might be all the time charming mm -hmm. because he's not a charming man. And the two girls come home in this little passage from Dublin because his, their brother has finally left the house. And they think that he's going to be very upset by this, but much to their surprise, he accepts it. And this is the passage around that. He drives them to the station uh, at the end of the stay. And he says, I'm thankful for all you did for Michael. He surprised them by saying as they waited in the car outside the railway station the next evening. We're sorry we couldn't get him to come home, Mona mumbled. I know you did your best. That's all anybody in the family can do. On the platform, he kissed them as the train drew in. They told him they would be down again before very long. The two sisters were silent as the train crossed the Shannon, traveling through fields. As the train was pulling into Drummond, the small platform black with people like themselves returning to Dublin at the end of the weekend. Mona said in an emotional voice, no matter what they say, Daddy can be wonderful. <laughs> Sheila nodded her head in vigorous agreement. When Daddy's nice, he's just great. He's like no other person. And even the small white stones under the lights on the station platform took on a special glow. Morn went out to the road and closed the iron gates under the yew after returning with the car from the station. He listened for the noise of the diesel train crossing the plains behind the house, but it had already passed. The light was beginning to fail, but he did not want to go into the house. In a methodical way, he set out to walk his land field by blind field. He had not grown up on these fields, but they felt to him as if he had. He had bought them with the money he'd been given on leaving the army. The small pension wasn't enough to live on, but with working the fields, he had turned it into a living. He'd be his own man here, he had thought, and for the first time in his life, he'd be away from people. Now he went from field to field, no longer kept as well as they once were, the hedges ragged, stones fallen from the walls, but he hardly needed the fields anymore. It did not take much to keep Rose and himself. It was like grasping water to think how quickly the years had passed here. They were nearly gone. It was in the nature of things, and yet it brought a sense of betrayal and anger, of never having understood anything much. Instead of using the fields, he sometimes felt as if the fields had used him. Soon they would be using someone else in his place. It was unlikely to be either of his sons. He tried to imagine someone running the place after he was gone and could not. He continued walking the fields like a man trying to see. Uh, man is the time I leaned on that passage. That's a wonderful passage. That's really nice. Uh, a lot of your, your fiction 
is, uh, is set in rural Ireland in, in an almost kind of timeless universe. And, uh, I mean, sometimes it feels like it could be the 19th century or the 1920s or contemporary times. And I wonder, what, I mean, Ireland seems to me to have changed a lot in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, I, I think of U2 and Sinead O'Connor and the way in which Ireland has sort of seems to have entered contemporary life more than it did even a generation ago. Well, I mean, I think there's some confusion uh, uh, about that because um, primarily a writer um, writes out of his private world, yeah. which is always spiritual. And um, I think nothing survives in a way that hasn't a quality of life or of the spirit. And I think that each of us have a, have a, has a private world within ourselves, and it's a world that others cannot see. And that the only difference between the reader and the writer is that, uh, um, you know, that the writer has a talent like somebody who can sing or paint, mm -hmm. uh, and he can actually bring, dramatize that pri his own private world, uh, which is the opposite of autobiography. Uh, because it's actually a world shaped according to an order and a plan, which uh, would be nice if life was according right, to that, right. but it's a series of accidents. Um, and I think that, the, that each person, when he reads a book, actually reads it with the same private world that the writer writes out of. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that if... I never know how a book is going to turn out when I begin it. And I, I have a feeling that if I wasn't setting out again on a beginning and on a discovery, is that there'd be no excitement for the re reader to find out mm -hmm. either. And somehow you can't fake that tension that's in the prose, even though the arrangement of the words may not be very different, because change the words and you actually change the whole stress of the, and the stress of the meaning. But I do think that I really dislike the notion of the artist as hero. I much prefer the notion of the artist as clerk. <laughs> uh, you know, and I think uh, Ibsen and the 19th century and the biographies of Mr. James Joyce has a lot to answer for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because um, uh, I think uh, that there's no difference except in talent between the writer and the reader. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, a book is a dead thing uh, until it comes to life in a reader's mind. Yeah. And if you have a thousand readers for the same book, you're going to have a thousand different books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been compared with all kinds of people, Chekhov, and Joyce, and uh, a lot of influences have been, have been uh, cited for your, your work, although obviously you know, you're a very unique writer. Have you had much involvement with American fiction? Do you, do you oh, look yeah. to any American writers? Oh, yes. I mean, I think that, uh, um, I mean, I think that probably American writing is the, uh, I mean, that the, you know, that, England is like five or six uh, uh, different languages now. Yeah. You know, the, we're all... Uh, I think Mr. Updike said when he gave Amongst Women the GP award, he says that, um, that we're all pupils in the school of the late um, um, British Empire. <laughs> and that he, he said very nicely that he thought that the uh, Irish and Americans were the star pupils there. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever about the Irish, I certainly think that... Uh, you know, some of the most exciting writing uh, in English has come from America. I mean, Melville uh, was one of my uh, early influences, and, uh, you know, I still think uh, Moby Dick, and especially uh, Bartleby the Scrivener, mm. is one of the greatest works ever written. Oh, yes. And it's as um, modern and as profound as Kafka. In fact, there's nothing different from Bartleby and the Metamorphosis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this uh, Ambrose Bierce is the person I like. Um, uh, I like a, a woman writer uh, called, I saw in the recent Henry James biography that he liked her very much, Sarah Arne Jewett, oh, who, yeah. who I think isn't appreciated enough here if she was a European writer, because um, she just wrote about it, marvelously about this little one place like Jane Austen in uh, Maine. I like Willa Cather very much, Flannery O'Connor, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Fitzgerald, um, um, you know, Miss Lonely Hearts is a wonderful book. I was uh, going to ask you about Nathaniel West. Uh, uh, and, uh, I mean, now you have Alice Munro in Canada. I mean, you have an Australian literature, you have an Irish literature, you have, uh, uh, and an, I think, a wonderful American. I like uh, uh, Richard Ford's stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think, there, I think it's a very, very exciting time uh, in America. Yeah, I do. John, I'd like to really thank you for being here today. It was a real pleasure talking with you. And, and it was uh, a pleasure to be here. Great.
and thank you all for joining us on the writing way.